Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to the Carsey Wolf Center tonight and for joining us in conversation with Feels Good Man director Arthur Jones and producer Giorgio Angelini. <laughs> So I wanted to get started uh, talking about the protagonist, Matt Fury. Um, after watching the film, it's clear how much negative attention around Pepe the Frog weighed on him. Uh, and it seems like he'd much prefer not to be a public figure after the unintended controversy. So what were your early conversations with him like about participating in the film? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. So, uh, you know, Matt and I met uh, hiking with friends and our first conversations didn't have to do with Pepe at all. I'd been a fan of his comic book boys club from back in the day. I'm an illustrator and animator and uh, I'd bought probably a couple of Matt zines in the um, mid 2000s and um, so when I met him I was like oh I, I knew who he was. Um, and then when the Pepe stuff started to happen a few years later we would sort of re reluctantly talk about it. and. Um, it was something that I could tell that Matt mostly wanted to avoid. It was something that you know wasn't at the forefront of his mind in part because Pepe was not a character that he was continuing to draw. It was something he'd stopped drawing in 2010. He was working on different kinds of artwork. He was kind of over it, but Pepe kept coming back. Mm -hmm. And so we'd initially talked about maybe trying to do like some sort of like animated series and I was gonna try to help him facilitate that idea. The idea for the animated series was that Maybe we'd create like a little mini series where like Pepe is pulled out of the boys club apartment and goes and fights trolls and comes back. We, we didn't know exactly, but we wanted it to be like funny and kind of irreverent and psychedelic. And um, when we pitched that around, it was clear that like no one was interested in that idea. That made that people were actively like scared of that idea. And also some people really, they didn't, this was at the height of Pepe being a hate symbol. And mm -hmm. some people thought Matt might have been like a Nazi or Matt might have been kind of alt-righty. And um, mm -hmm. people didn't know what to make of the project. They didn't know what to make of Matt. And so at that point, I remember being like, uh, Matt, if you are going to get this story out, it kind of has to be a documentary. And then, and, um, then at another point, um, you know, he just kind of asked me to maybe help him do something. And I pitched him the idea of a doc. I wrote up like a long kind of email to him and he and Ayana talked about it and they agreed that this would be a good idea. And then I started to reach out to good friends of mine um, and ask them to help because I was not a documentary filmmaker. I didn't know what I was doing. So, um, so I asked Giorgio and our friend Aaron and a few other people and it just kind of became a real group effort. Fantastic. Well, given that there's a range of knowledge about internet and meme culture amongst the audiences who've seen the film, who did you want the film to reach? As you mentioned, you know, there was ambiguity about where Matt's position was when it came to developing Pepe and, um, you know, is there an audience that you made the film for? I don't know, when we put it out, <clears throat> it was really sweet to hear that like, younger people would watch the film but then make their, made their parents watch it with mm -hmm. them, like a reverse yeah. thing and I, I thought that was kind of the ideal situation because I think uh, even though it's a niche topic film, I think for sure we wanted to, for people to feel empowered after watching it and understanding the kind of chaos that's washing over them on the internet to be able to contextualize it and understand it and understand that it's not random and that there is a definitive story and you can't just kind of like uh, decide things are true if they're not true. You know, like give yeah. people back their agency, give Matt back his agency as an artist, but also give people back maybe a bit of their agency in understanding their world. Mm -hmm. Well, and also we, f we felt for all of the like sort of, um, I mean, the media saturation in 2015 and 2016 surrounding Donald Trump was like so crazy and there were so many different kinds of stories being told about him. We felt like there was this particular lane with this story that was actually like really important. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted the inter we wanted the internet in this film to like, come alive a little bit. We wanted people who were deeply um, sort of entrenched in these places on the internet to see the film and recognize themselves in a little bit, but we also wanted it to really um, work for a, a larger audience that maybe was completely unaware because we thought the story was like surprising, unique, 
but also really important in terms of media literacy, the way that people think about this. When we started making this film, it was a couple months after Charlottesville. And it's hard to kind of, I mean, that was 2017. It feels like a long time ago considering everything that's gone on. But there was this moment where you really felt the, the darkest parts of the internet bubbling up, metastasizing, getting weird, and coming into reality in ways that were like surprising everyone culturally. And we felt like Pepe was this like amazing uh, character, this amazing protagonist to tell this story about what was going on in America. Absolutely. Well, you say you were, um, the internet was coming alive and you wanted the, that to, the internet to come alive in this film. And so I know you had a hand in developing the animation um, in the film and were responsible for some of the graphics that make the film so distinct. So, um, however, image boards and deep fried memes and <laughs> 4chan pages are not particularly visually attractive. So what challenges arose in making uh, a movie about the internet come across cinematically? Mm. Uh, making memes 4K, really, <laughs> tracing, that's the thing that you kind of don't understand when you watch this film is that you get all of these very low resolution memes and then you have to go into Photoshop and make them all 4K. And that's like, um, you have to take all those 4chan um, screen caps and you have to take the text from those 4chan screen traps and this is before AI transcription that will do it like this and you have to retype that <laughs> and so there was just kind of like a very laborious element to recreating those very ugly like kind of aesthetically uh, like flat <laughs> unassuming images around yeah. 4chan um, but Matt's world was something that I'd always loved I loved those characters and I thought that you know, I had a lot of insecurity when the film started, like, could I make this story? Did it make sense? Was I the right person to do it? But the one thing that I knew that I had was that I knew Matt's comics and I could, um, I could draw like Matt um, or I could at least like attempt to draw like Matt. And um, so we could make the animations in it really rad. But we got help along the way too. We had like three animators um, come in, Jenna and Kylan and Nicole to come help us at the end of the film too. And they, Nicole did this amazing scene that you just saw at the end of the movie that was great. Kylan and Jenna did a lot of the intro. So it was like um, definitely like a group effort for sure. But we wanted the cartoons to function in one way. Yeah. And we wanted the information from the internet to function in kind of like a different way. Mm -hmm. And then we just had to make some, some kind of, um, uh, you know, very specific aesthetic choices. For instance, you never hear Pepe talk. There's not sort of people that are acting out these characters. It doesn't feel like a South Park episode or something like that. And that gave us the ability to kind of really use Pepe in a more malleable way where he can illustrate the story. Sometimes that would be bringing Matt's comics to life, but then sometimes it would also be talking about the larger social contagion that was going on. And then in a couple places, Matt did the storyboards too. Like for instance, there was a, there's an image of like kind of a planet of trash and that came from directly one of Matt's sketches. Yeah, that part uh, when Matt is talking about how we live in a garbage world and we also create a tremendous amount of physical garbage um, and that the meme culture also um, can produce a lot of internet garbage. What was it like working um, with this immense amount of um, hateful material, offensive material? As you're saying, you, it was a laborious process to work through, I don't know, uh, adapting it for, for yeah. the film. Uh, well, just before we move on to that, I wanted to mention also that, yeah. that the sound edit has a huge component. You asked mm. about the aesthetics of bringing the internet to life. Mm. Um, would be remiss not to mention our sound editor, Lawrence, who's a really brilliant guy, and his task was quite a heavy lift, which was like, how do you bring two-dimensional dead space to life? Yeah. And like, yeah. I know when I sat in the first test of the first pass he did, it would like move me to tears because all of a sudden you understand and that's the magic of, of animation is also, you know, when you put that sound on top of it, it really like, your brain starts to create that world, fill in all of the lack of fidelity in a way that's mm -hmm. like really incredibly moving. Yeah. Yeah, and he did really creative stuff. He would like, he would take a bunch of keyboards and mic them in such a way where it almost sounded like a roaring campfire or something. So we, we, we just really tried to have like as much fun as we could um, with the kind of 
we knew there were certain limitations, but let's like try to fill in those limitations in the most creative way possible. But I the forget. less fun, the less fun part, yes, yes, sifting the through part. the yeah. sifting through the the bad stuff. Well, yeah. Shout out to our assistant editor Caitlin, who sifted through a lot of it, and all of our editors. <clears throat> um, that stuff exists, and you know, I, I think that um, that there is always that thing is like, well, what do you show, and what do you not show, and what is your rationale for doing those things. Um, you know, I was a very reactionary teenager. I was, 4chan was not around when I was a teenager, but I recognized a lot of the sort of like simmering anger, frustration, um, you know, paralysis of being like a kid who maybe didn't feel as though they had options. Okay. And so there was a part of me that even though that stuff was gross, I felt like I could like, uh, I, I felt like I understood it in some way. But I also think that 4chan, um, for as kind of off-putting as it can be, it's actually like a pretty amazing space because it has created its own language, it's created its own lingo, it's created its own mimetic iconography. Um, this is like an illuminated manuscript. It's something that has like been sort of group thought. It's like an oral tradition. It's something that actually I think is like really potent. Mm -hmm. and. We have seen so much stuff come out of 4chan, whether that's like meme culture, things like rickrolling, things that are like really innocent memes, but then also stuff like, uh, you know, QAnon. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of stuff, Anonymous, the hacker group, they came out of 4chan. Um, there's a lot of stuff in 4chan that actually has really dramatically rippled out into society. And I think that that's a story that like is fascinating to the team that worked on it and really fascinating to the audience as well. Yeah, I mean, the, <clears throat> for better or worse, yes, I'm, you know, elder millennial, so I experienced a time in my life without the internet and then the early internet, but the earlier internet was, for better or worse, essentially just a proliferation of, of garbage, so, like, yeah. I was pretty inundated in that uh, world growing up, so, like, the shock value of having to sift through all of this imagery wasn't as fatiguing, I found, as honestly, like, even though it's an anonymized board, I think I found myself feeling really, the more time I would spend on there reading people's comments, just like imagining the performative hate, the real hate, and the kind of like, um, the psyching up of each other and seeing how a thread could devolve and just feeling like a real sense of sadness for um, the self-inflicted cruelty people put themselves through. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that, that I think affected me more than like the images itself. It's just being like, I can't believe that there are people out there that just like spend all day doing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, your engagement with the 4chan users and meets in the film were particularly illuminating. Um, the for, male 4chan users regarded themselves as disempowered due to their neat status um, and, you know, saw the um, influx of women as a threat um, to the sort of the male 4chan space. However, I wonder about the extent to which these men were truly disempowered, or how did you come to understand the mindset of the neets? Were they truly living at the margins, or did they over-identify mm -hmm. with their perception of downward mobility? I, I mean, in a paradoxical or ironic way, I think they thought that they were responding to political correctness and the way that mm -hmm. media and culture was valuing otherness, right? Like suddenly it became um, social currency to be different, right? And there, on one hand, their response was to ridicule that and to tear it down, but at the same time they became, in a way, like victims of their own game at that. I think that you're right, I think the degree to which they are disempowered are not unique to them. It's unique to basically the working class. I mean, this is a response of, of you know, capitalism and the lack of opportunity and the expense of going to college and all that sort of stuff. That's not something unique to them, but all the same, they created, the one thing that 4chan excels at doing is, is creating self mythologies. And so it became very powerful them to consider themselves as like um, downtrodden because they're trading in that same social currency. It's like, okay, well, if you're, if people are celebrating uh, trans culture and these things that were marginalized communities, and we're gonna make ourselves more marginalized, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, 
totally misses the point and is unfortunately <laughs> like the exact opposite response. Yeah. I mean, there, there's part of this culture uh, is a clear entitlement. Yeah. There is something that, um, that a lot of these young men um, will feel where it's like they will feel trapped in whatever their circumstance is. They're stuck at home on 4chan. They're stuck at home playing video games. They're stuck at home watching cartoons and anime and all this sort of stuff, and they feel like there's no way they can get out of this. That stuff is like very seductive when you start doing it, but after a while it's fatiguing and it's like soul crushing when you're, that's all you do. And they imagine a world in which like, you know, times were simpler where, um, you know, they might have met a girl in high school in their small town. That person might not have had as many options. They would have gotten married. They might have had a job. This is, happens on 4chan all the time, but they feel as though they were born at the wrong time. So they've created this like very powerful aggrievement that ultimately just kind of reflects back at them to their old misery. And it's like, um, it's something that uh, clearly is like self-reinforcing and um, pretty powerful for the kids that just get stuck in this thought loop. Right. Well, and by default, 4chaners are anonymous. So how did you connect with uh, Mills? The uh, well, 4chaners are mostly anonymous. There is a system on 4chan where you can, um, you know, people do occasionally have names on 4chan. Uh, you know, it's called, you know, trip codes. Mm -hmm. um, they have, like, different ways of also, like, sometimes people will occasionally post photos or personal information on 4chan, though that's often looked down upon. Um, he was someone who was particularly popular on a um, board called R9K, which is the Robot 9000 board that's mostly populated by guys who are in the incel culture. Um, and it's a board that Pepe was pretty popular on. And when I uh, started thinking about this movie um, as a potential project, I knew that there had to be like 4chan in it. I'd never been on 4chan. I remember like going on to 4chan after my partner went to bed, and and I would just it would almost like felt like I would yeah <laughs> totally, and I would stay on 4chan for hours and just try to like um, understand it because each board has its own different like vocabulary. It has its own type of kids that hang out there, and I started to see pictures of Mills there, mm -hmm. and. Um, from there, I, got, I found like a little information. I realized that there was an archive of videos that he had made, and he made a video that I just happened to click on. It only had like a, vi like I was looking at the grid of videos on his YouTube channel, and it was a video that only maybe had like 12 or 15, 20 views, something like this, and I clicked on it, and it's the video that's in the movie where he's staring up into his phone, and he says, what does Pepe mean to me? And I was like, God damn it, okay, <laughs> this kid's gotta be in the film, let's find him. So, um, but it was something that like, just the feeling of that video, like I felt like he was reaching through the screen and talking to me. And so I'd found some information, and Mills and I started to talk uh, occasionally, and we would do these long rambling Skype conversations, and he eventually agreed to, to be in the film. So yeah, that's how, that's how it went down. Right. Well, and I noticed that a number of figures associated with the alt-right, like Milo Yiannopoulos or Richard Spencer, were not interviewed for the film or in the film. Uh, so did you have discussions about whether to reach out to them or to interview for them, sure. or did you uh, reach out? How was that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> a lot. We put a lot of time into talking about both the imagery and the voices that we would be platforming in this film. And it's less so now, but at the time, there was a belief that like there should just be basically like an embargo on all these voices and you know the giving them uh, space on the screen is just fueling the fire which you know in, in general I, I do think is true and I think for the sake of those characters in particular I think ultimately we just decided like we have to talk about them but there's not really much that comes from talking to them because they're trolls you know they're playing a character and so it's just being very selective about like, um, I think a lot of people in the past have tried to think that they're in control of that kind of interview, you know, whether it was Milo Yiannopoulos on, on Bill Maher's show or like documentaries made about um, Steve Bannon. You know, these there is truth that platforming them just gives them more fire, but I think, um, yeah, we but we still felt like there was a need to express that opinion and, and Matthew Brainerd ended up kind of operating as that yeah. role. Um, but we went in 
you know, very clear eyed about like what the mission was and what we were hoping he wouldn't, we wouldn't let him do, which is like use the opportunity to spin and like platform him. And anyway, I think it yeah. did pretty well. <laughs> yeah, at the time it was also like, there were people that were turning Spencer and Eli, um, Milo into like almost like mini celebrities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were a lot of other docs with those guys featured in them. And um, at a certain point we were like, this doesn't really make sense for us. But what was important was showing the people that um, those guys were appealing to. Yeah. Um, we wanted to show the people who were kind of downstream of their, um, you know, their incitement, essentially. Also, those guys were really trying to basically create their own, like, media brands at that time, and that was something right. that we didn't want to, like, even sort of, you know, platform, cosign, what have you. That didn't make sense. Um, and so, but yeah, showing someone like Mills, who um, has, like, a deep connection to the mimetics at work, we thought that was really interesting. Showing someone like Matthew Brainerd, who was an inside operator in the very early Trump campaign, who saw the power in this, we thought that's a cool story that hasn't been told before in quite yeah. this way. So we really, like in this film, we tried to like, we felt like there was a surface story that maybe everyone knew. You might get that from Wikipedia, you might get that from YouTube, but part of the journalism of this film is let's go three layers deeper and figure out how to get to like something that maybe people haven't seen or come at it from an angle that they haven't thought about. And um, we were just sick of looking at those guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's also the, to the to comment of earlier about aesthetics, it's like at that time, thankfully he's not really in the news much at all anymore, but like when people would interview Richard Spencer, the aesthetics of his representation were always in service of his ego. And it was very frustrating to see people just like, like this is gonna be a maybe silly reference, but when Lucy holds the football with, with Charlie Brown, like, oh, I'm gonna be the one that like makes him look like an idiot. But like, you shoot this big hero shot and you describe him as like dapper. And you know, yeah. you use all these signifiers that gives him credibility in a way that people like him long for, right? That's the whole reason they're using Pepe. Yeah. They're trying to be a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I mean, it's something that, like the aesthetics of this are very important to the movement of radicalization. It's something that, that um, uh, what's his name from Louisiana? The, the famous racist. Oh, David, David Duke. Duke, yes. Yeah. David Duke, you know, his- <laughs> The most famous. The most famous. His big contribution <laughs> to professional racism in America <laughs> is, the aestheticizing of it, and yeah. it's sort of like adopting and co-opting pop culture terms, words, dress, you know, yeah. like get rid of the hood, dress like a businessman, they'll take you more seriously. And so it was continually, what was frustrating us and what was part of the mission of this film was to kind of correct some of the way the media was portraying these people and just falling into that trap over and over and over again. Um, yeah. That's great. Well, uh like you said, you guys wanted to go deeper than the surface story. So there's so many eccentric people also interviewed in the film, like the uh, occultist and the rare Pepe's collectors. So uh, did these subcultures come as a surprise to you? Um, and uh, were you aware of these esoteric dimensions of meme culture? How did they come about? It's, yeah, well, just very briefly. It's <laughs> the funnest part about making a doc is that it's the discovery. Portion. You can yeah. research as much as you want coming up to it, but the minute you start filming and following the stories, it's just like you find these beautiful moments of gold that you never expected. Yeah, especially, but you got to work hard for yeah. those moments of gold. You have to like kind of like, yeah, you find one person, you're like, oh, maybe let's, let's find some. But anyway, yeah, the esoteric part of it, that was something that I, when I first started going onto 4chan, I would see all these like, you know, animated gifts of Pepe where, you know, it seemed to be pulling from all sorts of diff different religious iconography and remixing it, and whether that was from ancient Egypt or Hindu spiritualism, there was all these different things of Pepe. And at part, I was like, oh, well, this, initially I was like, oh, these are just jokes. This is just people kind of like mashing this stuff together because it looks cool. But the memes on 4chan carry layers and layers and layers of meaning. And there are people on 4chan that understand the power of this kind of culture jamming. Mm -hmm. And they talk about it in um, terms of, you know, a lot of different kinds of ways of talking about the occult, chaos magic. 
this is stuff that people talk about on 4chan. There's a lot of very smart people on 4chan who talk about philosophy and all this stuff. So people on 4chan started to self-mythologize and start to think about the way that memes move in culture in a way that was not just like trading jokes anymore. And so, um, you know, I, I think we found that really fascinating. Um, but, and we knew we wanted to put that in the film because there was also part of all of this that was like, you know, in 2016, you forget people are like, how did this happen? This yeah. is such a weird thing. It was like the rug got pulled out. And um, there was all this kind of like uh, just head scratching happening. And so we were like, how do we sort of like take this feeling and put it on screen? And so, uh, yeah, we, 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 we found uh, John Michael Greer and he, yeah, he, he, it's also one of those things, like sometimes you turn the camera on and you will occasionally do an interview with someone and you know when you turn the camera on, this will not make the film. <laughs> From like you end up shooting, first second. <laughs> yeah, you end up double shooting a lot. So there's a lot of people that we interviewed who didn't make the film. Some were great, um, but then when we shot him, we were like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the, the air in the room just changed. Um, and that's in part because he'd prepped, he knew the stuff really well, but it was also like we'd lit it in a fun. It was just it really just kind of worked. Like it was. It he was, was a sorcerer, and he changed the totally of the air. Um, wow. Yeah, and it was like it's also like we just want you have to also think of film just in terms of like casting anything, mm -hmm. whether it's a documentary, regular film. Like what what are the looks that people are seeing on screen? And he obviously just has like a iconic beard and yeah. a great look. And so yeah, and he's fun. He's funny. So but what I, I he was to me is like the heart of the film in that like. You don't know if you should be laughing at this or taking it deathly seriously, right? I think on on camera, and again, back to the aesthetics, it's like those were all like really deliberate choices. He's the only interview that we did, as I recall, like head on like that. And we gave him some gravitas on purpose to like, we're gonna give the guy who's talking about magic the kind of realist location. It was like where Edgar Allan Poe wrote poetry and mm -hmm. it's incredible space, but like, you know, whether you believe in magic or not, his his articulation of the idea is very compelling and it is a more, to me at least, a more robust explanation of this new phenomenon we have on the internet where like, what happens when you bring this brain trust of people and create that energy and put it out into the real world? And meme magic, if you don't take it literally, is a very interesting way to kind of understand how groups of people can online can kind of coalesce and affect reality just by uh, creating chaos and making noise, you know? It's, um, yeah, it's fascinating. It's also a fun way to just kind of like address the idea of propaganda in the internet yeah. age a little bit, which is like, you know, I mean, you know, flags are memes, songs are memes, slogans are memes. These are things that we carry with us and in history they used to be, you know, carried in different ways, books, movies, whatever. And the internet's just a new way of doing that. And even though it's like a dumb st stone frog, it still carries the, like the same weight as that stuff. And, um, and if anything, it's more transmutable. People can like figure out different ways of like trading it and sharing it and remixing it and making it their own. And um, yeah, so he's just like, I think a way of also just like, uh, having the audience question the film too, yeah, like because because you need a film to be sticky so that people will actually just like sit there and watch it. You know, people, you know, everyone has a lot of competition for their attention, and so in this you're like, oh, what what were the mo why, why is he saying this? What are the filmmakers' motivations for including him? You know, those kind of questions we hope to uh, bring up. Yeah, like the the personally the like the biggest bummer of watching a documentary that is covering something like a political topic like this is feeling talked down to or you know the message is written there for you so right I we think, didn't want the movie to feel like a news story exactly yeah yeah we wanted there to be discovery for people and and to, yeah like arthur said like really question the intention and and that was done deliberately so that people yeah can hopefully come to their own conclusion in a fun way yeah it sure was fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Feels Good Man premiered at Sundance in January 2020, and then the world shut down shortly after. Can you talk about what it was like to release this film during a global pandemic that limited exhibition opportunities and also may have had a level of influence in the elections that were upcoming at the time, or could have? Yeah, I mean, we... You know, it's like we started the film with pretty humble intentions, but as we 
kept making it, we were like, man, this is getting better and better. Um, this is an, we were more confident that the film was like interesting and that it had kind of like cultural currency. So yeah, Sundance was awesome, that was great. But yeah, I do remember there was another film festival called True False, which is this great um, indie doc festival in Columbia, Missouri, and I was there with the film and I was like talking to a friend on the street and as we were talking on the street, someone came up to us and at the time he seemed like a raving lunatic. He was like, in a month all these coffee shops are gonna be shut down, no one's gonna be on the street, movies are over. And at the time I was like, who is this nut job? <laughs> and he was talking about COVID and um, he was right. And um, you know, so yeah, it was this very weird slow moving experience where yeah we took the film out and then kind of all the stuff surrounding the film the election all of a sudden started to seem very small because we were dealing with this like international crisis so yeah it was it was destabilizing for sure well the the motive of the film was always for it to be a reinforcement of like a creative project with your friends and building community and so in a, the rosy colored view of the experience was that like it was a really incredible time and, a, and probably hopefully not one that will ever get repeated but the good thing was like we were able to get friends and some notable ones friends of friends to like really help us put the thing out and we tried really hard to make the release of the film re reflect the film itself in terms of the community and of artists and supporting each other and and you know try to make screenings which seems obvious now but then you couldn't do live virtual screenings with groups of people at high res. So like that was a big tech challenge we had to, to yeah. we basically had to use the internet. It was yeah. about yeah. the internet yeah. and we had to we had to leverage all the yeah. different tricks of the internet to get it out, including a lot of piracy. People yeah. pirated the shit out of yeah. it. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was the number two most pirated film behind Mulan. Yeah, the, the first week that it came out. So wow. yeah. that's a feather in our cap. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Right. Well, three years out from the film's release, the socio-political landscape has changed so much. So now that we're post-Trump, post-pandemic lockdowns, what do you speculate is next for meme culture trolling and whatever the next iteration of the alt-right or political trolling is? I mean, I think people are more aware of trolling now culturally, or at least I hope so. I feel as though some of that, like, um, uh, questions about what dog whistles and what aren't that people were like trying to figure out when it came to the Pepe conversation. I feel like there's an awareness of the way that like memes and the internet can work. Um, I think there was also kind of this, a lot of discussion when the film came out about how these platforms were enabling certain kinds of like algorithmic radicalization. radicalization. There's a much bigger discussion about that. So it's interesting though, you know, we see people like, you know, use Ron DeSantis, other characters that will try to start to meme, and it's actually something that has to be kind of like totally organic. <laughs> it doesn't work. You can't be Michael Bloomberg and pay a meme team. Um, it's something that kind of grows organically out of culture. So, you know, I can't predict what that sort of organic growth um, might be, but the world is in chaos right now. I'm sure there's going to be um, some pretty uh, weird developments that come out of that. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that you know, fascism thrives with disinformation and unfortunately the internet is very good at proliferating disinformation and the tools to create that have only gotten more powerful, um, you know, AI and deep fakes. And that said, I will say that I'm kind of uh, heartened to see how little of an impact that's made. My, my, my hope is that like when everything becomes when you assume that everything is fake, that maybe there you can re-inject some criticality back into the system again. Is I hope where this goes. Like if you just, we just have to get to a point where people fundamentally understand that whatever you see on the internet is probably not true. <laughs> you have to sort of start from scratch again. Yeah. Well, do you think we're living in a post Pepe world, or put in another way, what do you think is Pepe's significance today? Well, I mean, after this film, I mean, while we were making the film and then after the film came out, Pepe obviously took on yet another kind of like insane morphology where he he became like the Twitch 
sort of mascot for, you know, going poggers or whatever. So, you know, often when we took the film out and we would talk about Pepe, they didn't know about the hate symbol at all. The kids didn't know about the hate symbol. They didn't, they were just like, oh, he's poggers, Pepe's poggers. It does seem like mm, some of the Pepe stuff has dissipated, but I don't know, there was a big Pepe cash pump and dump like four or five months ago. Pepe completely um, still has this weird cultural stickiness and I think we will look back and be like, oh, this is, this is the face of internet ennui. This is the face of anyone who spent way too much time up in the middle of the night on the doom scroll and <laughs> they feel some kind of way about it. This is Pepe. And um, yeah, I think that it's not post Pepe, it's waning Pepe, I would say. Is it waning or waxing when something's going away? I can't remember. Waning. Waning. I think it's waning Pepe, maybe. I think as long as you can make a funny Pepe meme, it's going to work a bit. What becomes funny becomes harder and harder. Yeah. He's definitely not associated with the same sort of like toxic, gross, extremist stuff that he was back then. I mean, that stuff still exists on 4chan if you choose to go there. But it's kind of like the, you know, it's like the bubble gum has lost its flavor a little bit. Yeah. So I think most people, when they see a sad Pepe, they don't automatically assume that it's like some sort of dog whistle or something. They just assume it's a sad Pepe. So, I mean, I think that's a good thing. Great. Right. Yeah. Well, I've heard that you are working on a new project. So can you give us a sense of what you're working on or what it's dealing with? Yeah, we're, um, we kind of started a project as this one was finishing up that Mine's a lot of the same sort of cultural territory as this film. It's called The Antisocial Network. Um, it'll be out next year in April. And it's kind of, um, it's the story of, or at least a sliver of the story of 4chan. It takes place over a 20 year period. Um, and it's about the, the teenagers who started 4chan and um, how they inexplicably just like poked a hole in reality and all this crazy stuff came just like shooting through that hole. So, yeah. Yeah, it's about these group of kids who created this chaos machine and suddenly went from being disempowered, you know, self-described losers on the internet to like all of a sudden having agency and the ability to kind of warp reality and affect the world. And it's kind of a classic tale in the sense that, you know, like the Sorcerer's Apprentice or like, uh, you know, Gollum in the ring, you know, once people understood the power of controlling this, like everyone... Like the story of the internet, the story of 4chan is really the story of one person after the next thinking they can be the ones to control this hive mind yeah. and then realizing like there's no controlling it and it's just gonna burn you up. So yeah. it's basically the story of that flaming pile of shit being passed from one person <laughs> to the next. I mean, it's basically trolling. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, basically it's, trolling, it's yeah. the history of, yeah, it's, the, it's taking the conceit that a lot of this trolling behavior started on these message boards and like escaped it in all these crazy different ways. So basically, would you believe that January 6th started because like 20 years ago, some kids on the internet wanted to see boobs, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically, yeah. That's what's hot story. anime boobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, right. um, but yeah, and it uses, there's a lot of like animation in the, in the film. It's like a very stylish, fast paced, Film that I think if you like Feels Good Man, it will be right up your alley for sure. Fantastic. Well, we're really looking forward to that when it comes out. So I'm going to hand it over to Tyler Morgenstern from the Carsey Wolf Center, who's going to be taking questions from the audience. And um, yeah. Hi. Um, well, thank you again for such an excellent film and, and for coming here to talk to us. Um, I think what was really interesting for me about this documentary was um, the, how you identify that it wasn't just 4chan that started the Pepe the Frog kind of meme, kind of becoming nuclear, right? It was the uh, bodybuilding forums. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk more about like why that particular, because it's such a particular and specific subculture, mm. why it took off there and how it traveled from there and then onto 4chan. Well, you know, the bodybuilding forums are a place where people basically um, crowdsource information from each other, you know, because it's like people are figuring out like how to get huge gains, how to get jacked, all this sort of stuff. And so it's a very reactive community. It's a community where people are posting something, someone is posting again. It's also very masculine. 
Uh, it has a lot of crossover with like pickup artists, communities, stuff like that. And so 4chan has always had a fit board and the fit board has always been very feisty on 4chan. Um, and the fit board, yeah, is a place that uh, people would um, kind of talk a lot of shit about the bodybuilding forums because the bodybuilding forums were a little bit more based on guys just getting jacked or yoked or whatever, and then people would kind of talk shit about that on 4chan. Um, and so, yeah, for whatever reason, this character of Pepe just took off as a reaction image. It feels good. I don't know. I guess it, you know, it feels good to get sweet gains or whatever. But it wasn't just bodybuilding forums. There was like he was popular on a forum called Shroomery, which was like, you know, a, a mushroom psychedelics forum. He was popular on 420 Chan, which is a kind of side chan that was more drug culture related. Um, and then also the funny thing about it is. Matt, who is like very un-internet, didn't realize that there was an open link to all of Matt's comics on the back end of his website. And so they had figured that out on 4chan, posted those links so they could just take all of Matt's comic books that were scanned in and just remix them and do all this crazy stuff with them. So that feels good man image for whatever reason. You know, I don't know who the first person thought that that was funny, and I don't know if they were on the bodybuilding forum or not, but it just took off. You know, it feels good man to get yoked. So. But I would imagine it's also about aesthetics, right? It's like there's a reason yeah. these guys are trying to, in some way, it's like empowering, like, you know, you, you see people go in and out of the chans and in and out of these moments of, like, um, self-empowerment. And, of course, there's a very healthy side to, like, exercising and staying fit. But then it also it can devolve into this very weird... Like phrenological, phrenology, like sure, that's a word. <laughs> like uh, where they're, they're talking like about like jaw like socks, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They want to get like chin implants. Yeah, there's a lot of like kind of like the incel crowd or like uh, I hate use. It. It's like to talk about 4chan, you have to kind of use the tr the words of 4chan, and sometimes that's embarrassing. We'll avoid the gross ones, but yeah, the beta males of 4chan would go on to the fit board to try to figure out ways to kind of like, you know, hack their physique to make them more desirable. And Pepe became this avatar for like, I'm someone who sits too long on the internet, maybe I'm a little gross and weird, but I like being gross and weird. Um, I'm gonna revel in that feeling. And um, yeah, I think that there was just kind of like a synergy. Also Pepe just, Pepe feels like a weird old Muppet. There's something about Pepe that just feels like instantly like nostalgic. It's gross and safe at the same time. So that's interesting. I yeah, I don't know. That. If anyone has any questions about how to get yoked, I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to Georgia. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Arthur thank and Giorgio. You Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Thank you for, thank you for coming. Awesome. <laughs> thank you for the thoughtful questions. Yeah. They were all really good. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Mm -hmm.